Welcome everybody to our midweek Bible study service. I'm very, um, very excited to get going in chapter 20. I'm, I'm finding this chapter a little difficult to, uh, to not only understand but also to, to teach. And so um, I, I hope that um, what we're going to go through tonight, obviously, is, is all glory to the Lord, and that um, He reveals what He wants uh, revealed to our hearts. Um, but just the, the chapter itself is only 15 verses, and so um, I, I struggled in, do I rush through the 15, or do I kind of try to make a halfway point so that I can do the second half next week and, and cover the whole chapter, but um, I'm hoping to get through maybe eight or nine verses of chapter 20 tonight, and then um, we'll obviously finish um, next week, but um, before I, I, I get going on that, as I was uh, speaking about um, a moment ago with um, with with you guys, um, Rye had actually um, approached me about a month and a half, two months ago, about um, hosting a night of worship um, somewhere here in La Quinta. Uh, we were talking about the top of the cove. We were throwing out a couple of ideas, maybe La Quinta Park. Um, and, and, you know, I said, okay, you know, let's put that on the back burner. Let's get through some of the things that we wanted to get through this summer and, and get through obviously our anniversary celebration. Um, and, and obviously with the men's and women's thing planned for the fall, um, Ryan and I kind of talked uh, last week about it and, um, uh, we chose a date December 4th. Um, it's going to be at La Quinta Park at 5 p.m., um, on, on Saturday, December 4th, and, and um, she's getting some flyers put together. We're ordering a 1,000. We're going to canvas the cove. We're going to canvas down here and get the flyers out. Um, but we're really excited. What's cool about it, too, is that um, there is a special guest being flown in for this from Michigan. His name is Zach Radcliffe. Um, you can check him out on Facebook, on Instagram. Um, he's actually a friend of Ryan's um, and a family friend with the Woodies, um, but he's a musician and uh, loves the Lord. And so Zach Radcliffe is going to be coming out and, and leading us that night in worship. Um, and we're just looking uh, for a great opportunity to do community outreach, to praise the Lord, um, and to have just a really fun time um, partnering with obviously some churches here in the area as well and uh, enjoying a night of worship at La Quinta Park. So more details to come on that. Obviously, the, like I said, the flyers will have to hand out and, and we'll be canvassing the neighborhoods. Um, but if you wanted to help out with that as well, you're, you're more than welcome. But uh, Zach Radcliffe, December 4th, definitely looking forward to that. Um, with that being said and, and, and out of the way, um, get your Bibles open or you can follow along in the handouts. Everybody have a handout. I think I, I set uh, one in front of everybody. I'm going to read the first nine verses of Revelation um, chapter 20 and then um, open this up in, in, in a word of prayer and, uh, and, and get us going. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 20 says this, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be filled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, together 
uh, to gather, excuse me, them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. I'm going to stop right there, actually, in verse 8. Um, yes, verse 8. Uh, pray with me, church family. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, I pray that, uh, Lord, this little bit of anxiousness that I have in me, Lord, teaching this particular portion of Scripture would be removed, Father, that you would replace it with your peace, with your comfort, Father, with your wisdom, with your knowledge, and with your instruction as I relay this, this Scripture and this teaching to this church family, Lord God. Would you cause all of us to receive it with an open heart, Lord, with an open mind, Father, and would you get the glory in it all in the end, Heavenly Father. Real quickly, Lord, while it's on my heart, I want to lift up Russ and Jan to you as, as I'm sure they've made their way to their final destination in Texas today or this evening. Lord, would you bless their trip to Texas? Be with Anita and Bruce and their family, Lord God, as, as they celebrate the home going of her mom. And Father, ask for your... Um, mercy over them and, and for the Brooks family and all of our church family over there at the journey, Lord, would you put a hedge of protection around them, heal them up, Lord God, cause the symptoms of this flu, of this virus, Lord God, not to be any worse than it already is. And we just pray for divine healing and intercession in their lives right now as well, Lord God. We thank you so much. I ask and pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And so the events of chapter 19, of course, are over. And what did we see in chapter 19? We saw Jesus Christ, heaven open, Jesus coming down on, the, on, on that white horse, the armies of heaven behind Jesus Christ. And of course, we know that uh, he basically takes care of business while he's here on earth. Um, and so now we see John's perspective um, from earth, right? Because he saw... Uh, or he wrote in verse 1, and I saw an angel come down from heaven. So clearly John's perspective now is he's on earth. Now, when chapter 19 started, just to kind of put things together for you, he was in heaven. So chapter 19, he's in heaven. Jesus comes down. The armies of heaven come down. John clearly comes down um, according to this prophecy that he's been given here for Revelation. And now his perspective in writing chapter 20 is from earth. And with the beast and the false prophet, if you recall in chapter 19, thrown into the lake of fire. And with the remnant slain with the sword, which is the word of God, the, the remnant that, that had received the mark, had received uh, or worshipped the image, with the remnant slain, with the beast and false prophet in the lake of fire, the next thing John sees chronologically, and, and if you're tracking with me again from, from chapter 19, the next thing John sees is this angel coming down from heaven holding two significant things, Okay. First, he's holding the key to the bottomless pit, and he's also holding what's referenced as a great chain. It's not an ordinary chain. The Bible calls it a great chain. And what does he do with that? This angel, in verse 2, lays hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And so it's interesting here in verse 2 that John uses four different names when referencing our adversary. He calls him first the dragon. All throughout Revelation, the dragon is being referenced. The red dragon, the great red dragon is being referenced, and that is Satan. He's called that old serpent. There's a great Johnny Cash song where Johnny Cash calls him the old serpent. He's, uh, he ref he's referred to as the devil. We know him as the devil, right? And he's referred to as Satan. And so John leaves no doubt as to who he's describing when he's talking about this angel coming down and uh, a, a binding up our adversary. And what does he do? This angel cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now, what's interesting is we saw in verse two is that the angel seemingly handles Satan all by himself. 
tracking from verse 1 into verse 2, now verse 3. This angel is handling Satan all by himself. There's no reference of, of Jesus handling Satan. Now remember, Jesus cast the uh, beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire. Jesus also slayed with the sword the remnant that were in the valley of Megiddo. But it's the angel that is binding up Satan and casting him into the bottomless pit and shutting him up. Again, he laid hold on the dragon, the scripture said. So that leads me to question, who is this angel? Is this an ordinary angel? Is this Michael, the great archangel who we know has battled Satan for millennia? Um, we don't know. Um, he's not described, though, as a mighty angel. Anytime you usually read in the Bible um, somebody referencing Michael, Michael's usually described as a mighty angel. But we don't get that in this text of Revelation. But again, it could be Michael. Who knows? But nonetheless, an angel singularly appears to handle Satan all by himself. Now, this bottomless pit, and, and, and we did some study earlier on in Revelation about the bottomless pit. Um, in, in the Greek, it can be translated as an abyss, almost this never-ending uh, free fall, if you will, this never-ending well, this never-ending pit, um, which also is the dwelling place for demons, is the new prison for Satan. And it's sealed. It's, it's shut up. You, you remember when when Jesus was buried in the tomb um, after after his death, the, the tomb was sealed. Um, if you've seen, um, and I'm trying to remember the name of, of the movie off the top of my head, but <clears throat> I saw a movie where um, this Roman soldier basically goes out to try to find out by himself whether or not Jesus is, is, is who he says he was. And there's a scene in that movie where it shows the tomb of Jesus Christ, and it's sealed up, of course, with pitch, but also around it are chains, chains sealed into the wall as, as if they're, they're hammered or knocked into the rock so that nobody can remove that great seal. And so similarly, if you, if you can envision that, this bottomless pit is sealed, it's, it's shut up, it's covered um, with this great chain, again, that is referenced in, in, in verse 1 of chapter 20, and locked up with the key. Now, remember, again, the angel was holding the key to it, and he was holding the great chain to lock it. And so clearly this angel locks it, he seals it, this angel has the key, and that's going to be the dwelling place, if you will, of Satan for the next 1,000 years. Now, Think of it in terms of death row, okay? Ultimately, Satan is on death row. And during this thousand years, we, we, can, we can articulate, if we can, that this bottomless pit is Satan's death row. That's his holding cell before he's loosed for a season, but then when ultimately God comes down and, and strikes Satan and casts him into the lake of fire for all eternity. Um it, it's where he's going to serve out his thousand-year sentence, if I, if I can. Until, again, when the pit is open, he's let loose, which we're going to dive into in some upcoming verses. John goes on to say in verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they, they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast." neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So John sees these thrones and they, they sitting on them. Now the they is not clear, but all throughout the book of Revelation, we get some indicators as to who they may be. No doubt God the Father and the Son are sitting in, on their rightful place on the throne. No doubt. God the Father and the Son. However, based on the phrase, judgment was given to them, 
in our text, if you go back to Revelation 5.10, Revelation 5.10, the 24 elders declared that we shall reign on earth. And if you're put in a position to reign, ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake about it, you're also put in a position to judge. If you're put in a position to reign, you're also put in a, in, in, into a position to judge. And so these 24 elders all the way back in Revelation chapter 5 said that they will reign on earth. We also see at the end of this verse, verse 4, that those martyred during the tribulation live and reign with Christ a thousand years. We also see in the verse ahead, which I'll get to in a moment, that those who are part of the first resurrection, which I'll dive into in a moment, which is the church and the Old Testament saints, also reign with Christ a thousand years. And if you fast forward all the way up to Revelation 22, 5, it says that the servants of the Lamb will reign forever and ever. And so there's a lot of references in the book of Revelation in regards to reigning with Christ. And again, if you're given a position of reign, you're also given a position of judgment. Ultimately, though, it seems that at the end of the tribulation and at the dawn of the millennium, one of the first things established is government. Okay? The first things established is government. Now, I, 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 I beg you and I ask of you to bear with me because the word government today is a very scary word. Nobody trusts government today. Okay? But, but keep in mind... God created government. Man created politics, okay? But God created government. Now, I'm not talking about the established Democrat or Republican political type governments, um, but this is an established form of government with Jesus as king. Again, there's never going to be an election once Jesus established his throne and, and his kingdom here on earth. There's never going to be an election that can be fraudulent because of a voting system. Jesus is king for all eternity. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Nobody's taking away that throne. Nobody's going to try to... Uh, 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 take a have a coup against that throne. Nobody's going to try to supersede that throne. Jesus' throne is eternal. And so is his government that he's going to establish. There's going to be no place in the kingdom of Jesus Christ to be red-pilled. There's going to be no place to be blue-pilled. It's, it's Team Jesus all the way. Okay? Remember, Isaiah 9, 6 says this, and the government shall rest on his shoulders. God created government. There's nothing wrong with government. There's a problem with politics. Okay? Now, before I move on, it's interesting to note, as I mentioned a moment ago, those who were martyred during the tribulation are also reigning with Christ a thousand years. Now, they are spoken of in distinction to the church, which we know has joined the bridegroom at this point for the supper that we saw back in Revelation 19. And so right now, as the text is laid out, the church is... is, is is with its, its bridegroom. The bride is with the bridegroom. The church is with Jesus Christ, okay? But there's a reference that those that were martyred during the tribulation time period are also reigning with Christ during those thousand years. And it may be that while these are in, uh, while, while these are in heaven and are saved, 
or they were in heaven and are saved, they're now obviously on earth, they are not considered part of the church. And, and I went over that in, in detail when we were talking about those martyred during the tribulation versus those that were part of the church. They are separate, okay? Not that they are, are of any less value or any greater value in the eyes of God, but they are mentioned separately from those of the first resurrection, which we'll dive into in a moment, as ruling with Christ for a thousand years. And it may be that their rewards are different and their positions in the kingdom of God and in, in, in his established government are different. He goes on to say in verse 5, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, the last thing I want to do, and, and you all should know, be, know, know me by now, is, is present something that I'm not sure of. But who are the rest of the dead? Okay, who's the rest of the dead? that will not live again for the thousand-year time period. I believe them to be the unrighteous or unrighteous or unsaved dead. Those are those that have been killed, that have died, not saved, uh, unrighteous in the eyes of God, believe not in the Lord Jesus Christ, who will be dealt with at the great white throne of judgment coming up at the end of the chapter. And so it would make sense, if, 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 you, if I can paint this picture for you, it would make sense that during this thousand-year millennial reign of Christ, where there is perfection on earth, no sin exists, we are ruling and reigning with Christ, that the, the, the dead, the unrighteous, the unsaved, are not brought back for anything until the great white throne of judgment. Now, the statement lived not, uh, uh, again, um, they lived not again. The statement lived not implies that they won't be revived. So they, they, they were not revived, they were not restored until the thousand years is over when they receive their final judgment and are cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. Re remember, we receive our heavenly bodies when, 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 when Jesus Christ comes to get us, right? We're made new, we're given new bodies, we're given heavenly bodies. Now, I believe that similarly, those that are dead will be given new bodies. Again, you, you know, you're not going to throw somebody that's bones or ash or maybe has been shot up or maybe has been hit by a car and, you know, I don't, I'm not going to get graphic, but, but you, you're not going to put that on the great white throne of judgment and judge that and then cast it into the lake of fire. I believe that they will be revived. They will be restored, their bodies, so to speak, for the sole purpose of facing judgments and then being cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. Now, if you tie verse 4 into verse 5, the final statement of verse 5 makes sense. This is the first resurrection. There's a day when all the Old Testament saints when all the church saints, when all the tribulation saints come together and are established in the kingdom of God, the first resurrection, okay? Jesus was the first fruit of the resurrection. We are going to experience the first resurrection being resurrected to Jesus Christ. John then says in verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. 
you know, the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, we can be thankful and feel blessed today that we will never face that great white throne of judgment. I believe on that white throne of judgment, every single unsaved and unrighteous person is going to be, let, let, let me back up, is going to have their life flash before their very eyes. In, 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 a, in an instant, they're going to be very aware of their sins that they committed, their unrighteousness, their unholiness. They're going to be very well aware of, at that point, just how righteous and holy God is and his judgment towards them at that great white throne of judgment. And we can be very thankful that we do not have to stand before God and give an account for our past sins. We need to be extremely thankful for that. I don't want to give an account. I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed. I'm disappointed. I'm angry at myself. I could only imagine before a righteous and holy God what I would do. In fear and trembling, I'd fall. What am I going to say to God? Nothing. What's my excuse? I don't have an excuse. That's why Paul said in Romans uh, chapter 1 that they'll be without excuse other than to fall down. Say you're sorry? By the great white throne of judgment, it's too late. You, you, you're cast into the lake of fire. There, there's no repenting on the great white throne of judgment. There's no pleading with the judge for mercy. It's over. If you go to the great white throne of judgment, it's over. And folks, we don't have to face that because of Jesus Christ. And we, we need to be thankful for that. And as John says in, in verse 6, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. We're given titles. We're given titles as priests of God and of Jesus Christ. We all will have an, an active role in the administration of the millennial reign of Christ. What we're going to be doing is unclear. But when you look at the role of a priest in the Old Testament, if we're called a priest of God and of Jesus Christ, what were the priest's responsibilities in the Old Testament? They took care of the temple. They took care of the house of God. They ministered to God. They prepared the, the, the sacrifice, the meals, right? They had active roles in the administration of the, of the, the government, if you will, that, that God established. But folks, even if I'm just a doorkeeper, sign me up. Even if I get to sweep the dust off the welcome mats in front of y'all's mansions, sign me up for heaven. Now, how the roles will be divided, only God knows. But I think we can look back to the parable of the talents in, in, in Luke 19 to really understand how they're divided, okay? I believe that, that what we're given in heaven is based upon our faithfulness and service of right now. If, if you remember the parable of the talents in, in Luke 19, and I believe there's some, some, some other uh, uh, of the Gospels, one or two that pick up that parable of the talents, but, but the, the master went away and he, and he gave talents to, to people and, and people invested it. Uh, one invested uh, uh, the talent and, and got ten, tenfold increase back and another invested the talent and got fivefold increase back. And, but there's the story of the one that, invest, that, that didn't do anything with it. He didn't invest it. He buried it, right? And when the master came back, he was well pleased with the one that invested and got 10 talents and, and said, to much will be given to you. Much will be given to you. He even said to the same that, that got the five talents back, much will be given to you. You've invested wisely. You've done good for my kingdom, for my house. But what did he do to the one that did nothing? He actually condemned him, took his talent, and gave it to the one that had the ten. And so I believe that we can, we can use that parable that Jesus shared 
as a foundation as to how the kingdom of God is going to work when it comes to how the roles of administration and of priests and of government are going to be established and what our responsibility is going to be um, in that kingdom. Not Now, let me be clear. I don't believe that any one is going to receive anything worse. It's not going to be looked at as worse, if, if I may. Oh, well, you know, Jonathan over there, look what he got. He didn't get something as good as I did, right? Boasting. Boasting's not going to be in heaven. Oh, well, you know, look at the look at the 10, 10 houses that I get to rule over. Pride. Pride's not going to be... Christ's not going to be in the eternal kingdom. So I, 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 it's not going to be something that because he got fewer, she got fewer, he or she got more, that it's looked at from a vantage point of jealousy or envy or even pride. Um, but I believe that that parable of the talents kind of describes to us how God's blessings are going to be poured out when it comes to us inheriting the kingdom of God and our position as priests and, and judges and rulers, if you will, alongside Jesus Christ. He says in verse 7, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of earth, Gog and Magog, together, or to gather them together to battle the number of whom is at the sand of the sea. If you're like me, why in the world isn't it over yet? Why lose Satan for another thousand years? Lord, the, the, the false prophet and the beast are in the lake of fire. They're not coming back. Satan's locked in this bottomless pit. It's sealed. It's chained. He ain't going nowhere. Why lose the devil? Why allow him to come out and deceive again? Why? Why would you allow him to do it? Everything's good. Man, there's peace on earth for the first time since the Garden of Eden. People are walking around not worried about anything. There's no murders. There's no IRS. All the corrupt government's gone. Maybe this is the reason. Since the Garden of Eden, man has been faced with temptation and choice. Since the Garden of Eden, mankind has been faced with temptation and choice. The millennium is going to present a generation of people that have never had to worry about that. Ever. Not one time in their life will they have ever had to worry about making a choice between right and wrong. Because wrong doesn't exist yet. Because Satan's still bound up. There's been no deception during the thousand years. There's been no idolatry. There's, there's been no hatred. There's been no jealousy. There's been no exploitation. There's been no fornication that they've ever had to deal with. Now, it should be noted that there is most likely a remnant of normal, natural human beings left on earth, okay, who repopulate the earth over these thousand years. How's the earth going to get repopulated? How, if we go back to verse 8, how's the number as, as, as the sand of the seashore. How does it get back up to that number again? If most of the earth is, is wiped out, clearly God has saved a remnant, as he always does. Whatever God is laying the hammer down on his people or on a nation, God always saves a remnant. And it is clear that there's a remnant of people that is brought into the millennium that survived on earth, that never died. They never died during that seven years. We know if we go back in our study to Revelation that God hid Israel 
from the wrath of the beast uh, during the tribulation. Where he hid them, we don't know, but they are protected. Maybe it's them. Are there some uh, tribulation saints that got saved that were able to hunkered down and 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 survive the 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 wrath of god during those seven years possibly but there's clearly people that are alive that are given the opportunity and chance to repopulate the earth now if you study the scripture you know that if you die and go to heaven and if my wife and and i died before you know we're taken up and we go to heaven. She's not my wife in heaven anymore. We're not married. Um, we don't have married folks relations. We can't procreate, if you will, in heaven. We're, we're up there to glorify God and to live for him. And, and so that leads me to the point that there's clearly a remnant left of people that are able to repopulate the earth or whatever's left of the earth at that time. Now, how can anyone survive is beyond me apart from divine intervention. But it's these individuals who have never faced the satanic temptations and deceptions that we've had to face and that have plagued the earth since the Garden of Eden. There will be people born in those thousand years that will never know the hatred and the evil and the wickedness that we know today. And it appears that God, clearly, because Satan's going to be loose to deceive, it appears that God will allow them, just as he allowed Adam and Eve, by the way, folks, the prospect of making the decision to trust in him or to follow the devil and be deceived. The same choice we have today. The same choice Adam and Eve had in the garden. Are you going to trust what God said? Or are you going to trust what the serpent said? There's been a thousand years of righteousness. There's been a thousand years of blessings from God. They've known nothing but his goodness while Satan was bound. But God apparently will put these on equal footing, if I will, or if I can, with their brethren down throughout the ages. Just as we've been tempted, just as Adam and Eve been tempted, God is going to give them an opportunity to be tempted. And they will be faced with the choice of trusting God and his goodness or giving into the temptations and the deceit of the devil. And it seems that many, and this is this is the saddest portion of this of this scripture right here. It seems that many will join the forces with Satan and rebel against God because again, the Bible, the, the text says, and the number of them is as the sand of the seashore. That's a lot of people. You can't count sand. But clearly, the, the earth is repopulated once again. To, a, to an astronomical number, maybe even in the billions during those thousand years, and many will join the side of Satan and rebel against God. They've been given the choice. Satan comes out to deceive. And listen, that is Satan's uh, uh, um, modus operandi. That's his MO, is to deceive. If I can just deceive them, if I can just get them to think away and separate and apart from God. I'll, 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 I'll wiggle my way in. I'll worm my way in and distract them from what they've known. Adam and Eve knew nothing but God's goodness in the garden. And they were tempted with something they thought to be greater that was a lie. If they would have just listened to what God said, and heard what came out of the devil's mouth, they would have seen that it was a lie right from the get-go. There is no truth in the devil. He does not utter a single word of truth. And as John tells us, another gathering of Satan's forces against the saints of God is going to take place. 
So clearly, and there's not a time frame on this written in the Bible, but clearly Satan deceives the multitudes. And here we are again, back another chapter or two in the book of Revelation, like we were when they were starting to converge in Megiddo. John tells us that the forces of Satan and these that have decided to join his ranks come against the saints of God. Now, historically and geographically, Gog and Magog were nations to the north, northeast-ish of, of Israel. And they're the nations that are mentioned in Ezekiel 38 that come down and attack Israel, I believe, at the early part of the tribulation, if not right before the tribulation time period starts. But if you were to look at Gog and Magog on a map today, you would have Russia, okay? Rosh, R-O-S-H. But you'd also have all the stands that are below Russia. Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan. Can anybody else, what other stand I'm missing? Afghanistan. Magog. Is Afghanistan in the news right now? You bet they are. Who is Afghanistan's number one supporter right now? China. To the east of Israel. Remember we talked about nations coming from the east to the Valley of Megiddo. I'm just trying to connect some dots for you guys. But Gog and Magog on the map today is Russia and all your, all your stands. All your stands. And it's the place where Satan will gather his forces, Gog and Magog. They will gather in the stands. They will gather in Gog and Magog and then go to attack God's people and the holy city. Jerusalem, right? They're going to gather to come against God and his states and his saints, excuse me. Now, I, I want to stop right there, obviously, to give room to, to what I want to um, go into next week to finish out chapter 20. Um, but, but this is a lot to take in. Um, I, I, even though I've studied it, I still, again, cannot answer the question directly other than speculation as to why God would lose Satan for those thousand years. Or, or, or why not just end it? Let's just get over it. Let's just stop it. Enough is enough. But as I mentioned either last weekend or the weekend before in, in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things are for the Lord. And he is doing something after those thousand years with the people living on earth that we may never we may never find out what what is he doing what's his purpose what's he trying to accomplish other than giving them the same opportunities that we've had passed down to us throughout the generations since Adam and Eve they had a choice they'll have a choice at some point too clearly because the bible says that they'll have a choice to either continue to worship god or to join satan and the multitudes joined Satan at that time, which is unfortunate. And it's unfortunate today that people are joining themselves and aligning themselves with the devil anyways, and they don't even know it. <clears throat> with that being said, any, any questions, any, any go-backs, any comments um, that I can clarify or, or, or cover for you guys or answer before, uh, before I pray and close this out? He I thought the heavy stuff was over, but I was lying, obviously, I, you know. <laughs> You know, I studied this. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is all, it's all, you know, unicorns and rainbows for the rest of Revelation, right? We're, we're going to be, we're going to be with God for all eternity. But, man, I start to study this thousand, this post thousand years. And it's like, wow, why would people, why would people turn away from the goodness that they had and follow? I don't know. We have to ask Adam and Eve why they did it. Why do I why do I know I have the goodness of God, but yet sometimes I choose to be a knucklehead? I can't answer that question. We have to answer it for ourselves, right? Um, but oof, 
Yeah, he, I mean, he does. I mean, obviously, love and mercy, right? Mercy. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, and maybe it is a test of, do, do they really love me the way that they say they love me? Are they worshiping me because they believe who I am or because it's fake worship, false worship? You know, that was the problem with a lot of the hypocrites in Jesus' day. You know, the Sadducees and Pharisees is, you know, they, they spoke out of their mouth, but their hearts were, were evil and wicked. You know, they said they they said things, but their hearts, you know, their hearts weren't in the right place. Yeah, okay. They threw up prayers, but their prayers were done in vain. And with Adam and Eve, I mean, how much more could he have given them, but yet it just wasn't enough. Right. But th- in know. the flesh, it wasn't enough, know. right? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know either. I mean, you know, I just, I just want to be in heaven right now. I don't even care. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, and. Yep. Yep. Trust the Lord, boy. When when things are when things are falling apart, they're falling into place. I got to keep reminding myself of that. So, anyways, let me uh, let me close this out in a word of prayer. And if you guys have any questions, we can discuss afterwards. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much, Lord, for your word, Lord. I I thank you for um, sometimes the shock of your word, Lord. The um, the humbling and the humility from your word, Lord God. And, and Father, even though I can, I can sit here and question why, Lord, what I'm not doing is questioning your sovereignty and, and your purposes and your will, Father God. You are omnipotent, uh, Lord God. And, and, and Father, all we can do is trust in you with all our heart and lean not on our, on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge you so that you can direct our path, Father God. And I pray that that individually, Lord, you would direct our paths, that collectively, Father, you would direct our paths as a church family and as a church body towards you, Lord God. And that, Father, we would be diligent, diligent today, tomorrow, and as long as you tarry about the kingdom, Father, because that's all that matters. Putting our faith and hope in an election, in a recall, in whatever's going on in this world, Father, proves futile. It is discouraging, it's disappointing, and it's frustrating. But Lord, when we put our faith and our hope and our trust in you and in the kingdom of God, we have hope, we have peace, and we have comfort. So Father, cause us to keep our eyes and our affections on that and not on things of the earth, as Colossians 3, 2 says. Father, protect this church family, Go before them. Bless Russ and Jan, Lord God. Be with the Brooks. Father, I pray for healing. I pray for safety. And just ask that you bless this night. It's in the mighty name of Jesus I pray. Amen.